Well, welcome everyone. Uh, thank you for coming um, to join us for this very special occasion. Today we will be hearing from Margarida Massimo Prado, who is the um, Fall 2015 Plato's Fulbright Chair in Brazilian Studies. He's going to give us a talk that has finally settled on the following title. We may have received posters that said any number of other things. <laughs> but this is, in fact, we think the thing that he's actually going to talk about. Um, so having settled on the title, he will talk to us about this today. I just want to say a few things about him and a couple of other things, and then I'll turn it over to him. Um, Michael is uh, the director of the Center for Human Rights and LGBT Citizenship. Um, at the Federal University of Minas Gerais, where I have the pleasure of being really nice at the part of the time. Uh, he is also a professor of social psychology there, which is somewhat misleading because when you hear his talk, it doesn't really sound much like a social psychologist uh, in many ways. Uh, he's indeed instead uh, a highly recognized interdisciplinary critical cultural uh, and social theorist, uh, a feminist and LGBT activist, and scholar. He's one of the foremost scholars in the, in the field of feminist and queer theory in Brazil um, and uh, has conducted interdisciplinary research and published widely on an impressive range of topics including citizenship, identity politics, social movements, civil society, and the state, feminisms, and queer politics, participation, transgender identity and movements, and so on and so on. Um, so we're delighted to have him with us this semester. I encourage all of you who haven't already done so to look for him near our quarters at the center. He's right nearby in one of the offices. He doesn't just stand in the hallway waiting for people to be there. Um, and I also want to take this opportunity to, um, since it's our beginning, it's not our first function by any stretch of the imagination, but we're celebrating the beginning of the year today. I wanted to also introduce two other visiting researchers that are with us this year, one of whom is Anahi Morales Udan, um, who um, is a postdoc this year uh, for the entire academic year. She holds a PhD in sociology from McGill University, and her work focuses on indigenous women's movements in Mexico using a framework that combines intersectionality and social movement studies. Wow. <laughs> and then we also have the pleasure of having with us Laila Carvalho, who is a Fulbright graduate researcher uh, from the Department of Political Science at the University of São Paulo and works on feminisms and women's health care. So please join me in welcoming Marco to the podium and extending a warm welcome to all of them. <laughs> After you've listened to you, Michael and you've done the Q&A, we'll have some refreshments. I was going to take your talk away <laughs> by heart. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, so, first of all, I'd like to say that I'm very pleased to be here. Very glad to uh, get this opportunity to share some of my ideas with all of you. Thank you all for coming. And I want to thank my Fulbright mentor, Sonia Alvarez. Obrigado, Sonia. Sonia, it's always a great pleasure to share political ideas with you and learn from our experiences. I want to thank Gloria Ramos and Mili Tire for all the help in generosity since my arrival here on campus. Gracias, Gloria. And also, I would like to thank both the Fulbright Foundation, for sure, and the UMass for supporting my work here. So my talk today is about the gender norms, the paradoxes and complexity around the normative and non-normative claims in the political experience of transgender subjects in Brazil. Uh, <clears throat> as Hansier has written, political experiences make, makes us understand as a discourse what was once only hurt as a noise. My talk today is about uh, 
this point. Actually, I hope to share with you some analytical ideas about my current work in Brazil, rather than show empirical information. If you'd like to learn more about the empirical information related to my research, we can talk about them later. I'm speaking from the perspective of radical and plural democracy theories, as well as some anti-essentialist critical point of view. I'd like to present some ideas that I have been working on to understand how is it possible to democratize democracy. Especially if we look at democracy from the point of view of those who have been historically considered pathological and abnormal. Since a regime of sensibility determines what presents itself to sense of experience, I pose the following question. How do transgender people dislocate our sense from a kind of supposed universal and natural supremacy? I'm going to explore the concept of social norms and gender norms, their tricks and games towards to the idea of political subjectivation as it's seen as an interpolation of social hierarchies, specifically gender hierarchies. Authors such as Hans Yer, Ernesto Laclau, Chantal Mouffe, Judith Butler have had a strong influence on my thoughts. Based on my professional experience with transgender social movements in Brazil, and based on specific theoretical perspectives about politics, gender norms, and their harmful power, I persistently ask myself about how can we think about democracy from our everyday life experiences, from our own bodies, and from our own subjectivities. As Laclau and Wolf have a red shone the emergence of modern democracy made an empty space of power. The modern democracy has broken a political theological logic that defined different positions for each individual in our society, and yet affirmed the universality of equity and freedom. If it didn't do this to everyone, it did to a few. The democratic imaginary allowed for inequities and exclusion to emerge, which until had been justified as natural, in a kind of natural social hierarchies. Now it's possible for them to be challenged as a form of oppression and subordination. Therefore, the democratic imaginary became an important discourse so that those individuals who found themselves in subordinate relationships could organize themselves to expand the democratic principles of equality and freedom. As all of you know, the idea of individuals organizing themselves socially and politically is very complex, mostly because political collective subjects emerged in and from different levels of social work. Also because they are heavily impacted by the outcomes of the regime of sensibility that determines our sense about what should be legitimate as a political action or not. Through the influence of the democratic imaginary, a wide range of demands emerged since the beginning of the democratic revolution. In modern democracies, one of the most important family, against the neighbors, is the emergence of political subjects and collective actions. In order to understand political subjects in the contemporary societies, we have to be open to new approaches, which allow us to understand a multiplicity of political subjects and the influence of their actions to subvert the regime of sensibility. Classical approaches of social movement theories, like the resource mobilization, and cycles of protest theories do not seem to be useful anymore to explain new political subjects that have engaged 
and emerged from different social levels and from heterogeneous subordinate positions. Probably, these classical approaches are no longer useful because we are speaking about subjects who do not fit in that stereotyped organizational collectivity and, in a rational way, lead us to think of them as a social antagonisms. We are talking about more passion in politics rather than rational discourse. The classical theories about social movements have been unable to explain many collective subjects since they cannot account for different actions which are not related to rational and reasonable social practices. As Mofa has demonstrated, the set of theories could not embrace all the political subjects who have moved into passion and politics. <coughs> Taylor said, by politics of passion, then I refer to the mobilization of affect for political ends on collectival, on collective structure and trans ideological levels that skirt the traditional organization of political parts and practices. The transgender political movement is one of the most important to help us understand bias, passion, and politics to action for democracy. Today, I will try to explore what are the paradoxes and tricks in the hegemonic gender norms. What kind of political struggles are these subjects going through in Brazil? And finally, what are the consequences of their political actions to produce a different regime of sensibility that cannot be grasped without changing our lens of our own privileged position? Social norms can be seen as a set of discourse based on history and culture that make us feel more or less legitimated in a specific society. Foucault said the norm is something that can be applied to both. A body of one that wishes to discipline and a population of one that wishes to regularize. It can be seen as a link, he said, between disciplinary power and biopower. Specifically, Foucault's idea about norms has influenced a lot of feminist theories, even though he had not pointed out any feminist view, which in fact is a very controversial point about Foucault's work. But his concept of norm is a strong one to understand how gender acts has created normally, normality, normalized bodies, and legitimized an image of masculinity and, or and femininity in our culture. His concept of norms can help us to understand how social hierarchy determines everybody's location and function, and how it excludes other bodies from the set of recognition called gender norms. Gender norms are a set of discourse and imagery in a specific cultural context that can link the discipline of social worlds and the wishes of what's to be masculine, feminine, or either. Gender norms are the frame in which we, as a subject, can be understood as a legible subject. It is not simple since to be legible is to be invited as a human being to play all the acceptable rules and laws of recognition. In Butler's thoughts, gender norms are norms of recognition at which we might come to appear enabling but also restricting the possibilities of our appearance in the social world. Social norms in Butler's work on gender can be defined at the outset as a specialty social norm that has to do with the performing or acting in social reality. Unlike the instance legal norms, this kind of a social norm may well operate without ever, or at least typically, being alleged in written or spoken form. In this way, the conditions of human intelligibility are composed of a set of recognized norms. One of the primary recognition norms is the gender norm. 
since it's a set of practices, discourse and scenes, that produces a normative framework to recognize or not some bodies, to make them legible or not, and also the system of legitimation that justifies and explains that framework as part of things. In the same way, these norms can produce the conditions of human intelligibility. Thus, these conditions can restrict the appearance and the recognition of all the bodies. It's a paradox that we live with all the time. The same discourse which excludes one body is the one which makes another body viable and readable. We are facing the paradox of social hierarchies. Since we all need to be subject and to be recognized as one, even though this double movement can deny some people to be recognized or make their recognition negative and or a harmful one. As Butler has shown, gender norms can be a political file since they cannot be, they can, sorry, they can be open to the significatory process that might sometimes redirect their meaning. So by doing the significatory process, one should mock, expose, and problematize them. One should play the experience of a political subject. As Hansia has noted, one should play the experience of political subjectivization, which contains three elements, the argumentative demonstration, the dramatization, and the disidentification process. The resignificatory practices are political experiences, and I want us to take Rancière's definition of political subjectivization to understand how transgender subjects can be raised by political action, living in the paradox of gender norms as a social hierarchy. Rancière's definition about the disagreement between politics and the police is very fundamental to explain how social hierarchies work and how science and many other different discourses, such as the moral and religious discourse about gender, has supported the hierarchical social order. Hansier had pointed out social hierarchies as oligarchic structure societies in his field. We all live in oligarchies that can be challenged and transformed in many different ways. He adds a new concepts of politics in order to open up a different space for thinking democracy. In Chambers' view, he separates democracy from interest group competition, civil rights, liberal constitutionalism, and all the other institutional and legal forms with which democracy is so frequently conflicted. In Hansier's work, polit politics can have two different actions, two different rationalities, and two heterogeneous logics the logic of policy and the logic of politics. The politics is generally seen as a set of proced procedures whereby the aggregation and concept of collectivism is achieved. It denotes the organization of powers the distribution of places, roles, and system for legitimizing distribution. I propose to give this system of distribution and legitimization another name. I propose to call it policy. Since policy means a symbolic order in the arrangement of bodies, it determines an order of the vis visible and the sayable. It also determines the intelligibility of the bias. Policy order means a kind of legible social life. Any hierar hierarchical social order which organizes the everyday life is the policy. Gender norms are just a good example of it. It's very important to highlight that for Hansier, policy doesn't mean any pejorative order. It's an archaic which determines places, voices, and powers distribution to make someone 
more feasible and legitimate the norms. It's a specific regime of sensibility to think about social life and people's rights. In policy order, there are those who benefit and those who do not. The policy order is, in this view, the limitation of the field of possible experiences. Politics, in Hansier's definition, is the opposite. It's the politics of the demos, of the people. Politics is always a mode of expression that undoes the perceptible division of the policy order by implementing a basic heterogeneous assumption that of a part of those who have no parts, an assumption that at the end of the day itself demonstrates the sheer con con contingen contingence of the order, the equality of any speaking being with another speaking being. Politics in this field is the collective experience that deconstructs social order producing political subjects, not identities. Let me clarify this question because it's very important for me. Hansier said, by subjectivization, I mean the production through a series of actions of a body and the capacity for enunciation not previously identifiable within a given field of experience. Whose identification is, therefore, part of the reconfiguration of the field of experience. Political subjectivization is not an identity. Rather, it's more a subject in between many different identities, more about dislocated identities. As it has been noted by Chambers, the theory of the subject subject as in between revolves powerful affinities with queer theory, thinking of norms, subversion, and subjectivity as positionality, as relationality. Queer political practice and its theory of the subject as in between can give us some important analytical tools to understand these paradoxes of gender norms where we can be recognized as a human being and negated as a legible subject at the same time. I want to take this point of the paradox of any social order, this idea about who can speak and be visible, accountable, be heard as a speaking subjects, to understand how gender norms as a policy order create many different tricks as elements that play a complex game when one thinks about political actions throughout these norms. I have you referred to these elements as a tricks, not because there is something true or false about them. They are tricky because they are a game of powers, an interplay of visibility and invisibility, a type of illusion about how social order has stabilized by denying the contingency of which it makes everyday life a reiterated life. But in a seamlessly way, it makes such an idea of gender, which works by giving us some legibility in order to negate others. Tricks are games inside the social hierarchies of gender in which all of us are going to be invited to play at different levels and take some or any recognition of these levels. I want to say a few words about this, about these tricks of gender norms. I think these important elements may help us to think about political actions. I am naming them the as a trick of permanence trick of immanence, trick of obedience, and finally, the trick of resilience. The trick of permanence is again about how gender norms, through the mechanism of foreclosure, can deny its own history. To be clear, if gender norms are historical sets of discourse and social practices, which can make us legible or not, why are they seen as a permanence 
and not part of a historic and contingent social order. One could ask how a social hierarchy can be maintained since all social hierarchies are socially, pol political, and economically constructed. Why the contingents as an element cannot appear in order to reveal how hegemonic ideas about gender have been constructed in our history? There are many ways to answer these questions. Since gender norms are foreclosed, which means to erase all the contingents of their own materiality. The trick of permanence is the opposite of contingents in a way that makes gender norms as the truth of gender a kind of denominator that pretends to be neutral. The trick of permanence addresses a universal point of view that denies all particularity of bodies. As Laclau highlighted, the logic of incarnation that negates the contingent process to build a hegemonic universal that pretends to be a neutral universal. So, what's very important here is that the contingent relates to history and this trick plays the game of permanence, which means that gender norms show up as a natural for us. They seem to be related to some sexual biological differences in differentiation of bodies and so on. The transgender political action in Brazil has been denounced as the cisgender. The cisgender is a person who has been assigned as a man and a woman in this binary uh, context and has been comfort and conforming to it. Someone like me, for example, the opposite of transgender. So the transgender political act in Brazil has been denounced as the cisgender position is an attempt to show the contingence of that neutral universal. This makes sense because it demonstrates the history, the history, the, the history of social, social agents and the process in which we gave transformers the cisgender position into a dominant one and, make, and take all the advantages of it. Paradoxically, it has created a new binary position, even though I think that can be a good strategy to expose the cisgender as historically and culturally constructed. There is a fragile and stable condition that needs to be shaken up. Political subjects may imagine another world in order to dramatize the idea of permanence in reality and to expose some argumentative demonstration to reverse the contingence of all social war. As Hansia has noted, the argumentative demonstration reverses the effort and the capacity to say we are equal in such iniquity social war. This kind of demonstration needs to be addressed to the social hierarchy to be heard as a discourse. The second one, the trick of immanence, makes us to believe that to be masculine and to be feminine or either is an internal essence immanence to be a subject. In addition, the idea that a permanent behavior that keeps this essence as a real subject. That's what Derrida has named it as the metaphysics of the presence. The performative theory helps us to understand this. The reiteration of acting produces this presence of truth. The idea that I am a man because I produce every day a set of acts conforming to the hegemonic norm that makes me a man, a real one. Here we have a strong point about political actions. The transgender social movement many times has enforced a real identity as part of social order. It seems that it claims for one more identity among several orders in the political field. I mean, in the logic of policy. Hansier has stated, there is no politics everywhere but everything can be a political if the action litigates both 
the social order, and the stable identities. This idea about the metaphysics of the presence is part of the policy. Where there is a strong identity, there is not a political subjectivization. The political subjectivization is a symbolization of a given identity. It is this capacity of symbolizing it, it deconstructing it. It is a desidentification process. We cannot forget that to have a strong state, for example, we also need to have a strong identity. Many times the state produces identities in order to keep everyone in the right place, in order to regulate them, in order to keep us in the right position, and so on. We could see the struggle in transgender social movements in Brazil when transgender men had launched a new political group. It was hard to understand why the transgender woman movement couldn't accept the new men's group as part of the same movement. There was a real struggle about which identity was more valid or not. So, in Hansier's view, this is more part of the policy where every identity needs to be regulated as part of the political logic. The new transgender group of men was asking access to the public health system and a specific public policy about the reproductive sexual rights. The transgender woman movement did not legitimize any of their claims since they were not recognized as a trans identities claims. So it was a very strong conflict that had been discussed with the government stakeholders. After several iterations, the state representatives created a, legitima a, legitima a legitimization process to validate one specific group of transgender men, but not all of us. At that time, many of the women from the transgender movement said they are not really transgender individuals. They are just lesbians seeking for opportunities to ask for money and participate in government project projects. They do not know anything about having a real transgender identity. As you may not see, the humanists can play an interesting game to affirm and consent. More identities when some conflictive positions are demonstrating illusion of identities. This humanist is also creating a kind of truth identity for everybody. The transgender movement right now is struggling with some academic cisgender me, for example, some academic cisgender position about who can speak about transgender and who cannot speak about it. It seems that we are seeing a new political dispute about who is original and who is not, who is native and who is not, who has the permission to speak about the others. Paradoxically, we are facing a new position about who is the true body and who is allowed to speak for. The third trick, obedience, is a kind that uses all the system of, of legitimization to confirm that those enrolled in the gender norms are true and cannot be questioned. Especially when some people start questioning and somehow exposing the harmful powers of typical binarism of gender norms. Every single time that transgender political subjects are shaking up the norms, are making the cisgender position aware about the illusion of being a masculine or a feminine, we are always reinforcing obedience, confirming that goods are important values and must be recognized. We can see obedience attached to gender norms everywhere, every, everywhere. every organization, every institution, and this is a political struggle which needs to be faced. Many transgender issues in Brazil have not been faced as a political issue since the social movement has been lived inside the states and it's very subservient to it. I have called this 
an assimilationist position in which the Brazilian society can be seen as a good example of a new institutional political frame of deliberative democracy. Everything is about participation. However, the government has already framed the conditions of social and political participation. We have seen this happen in different social movements in Brazil since political parties created their way to mobilize population in order to frame political participation in such a narrow way. Everything is about participation, but not about decision-making and new distribution of power. The obedience is a trick that works very well to make a behavior a political, polite way to protest. There are many popular forums and public meetings where transgender individuals have been engaged, even though it's less legitimization than others. This type of engagement in Brazil is much more used for keeping the social world than for challenging it. The last research study that investigated the role of these public forums in Brazil showed that less than 6% of the public proposals have turned it into important law for rights in Brazil. So, why do you have so many popular forums if they cannot really change or challenge the social world? In the social gender hierarchies, the subservience is a well-known element. To be in the bottom is the fundamental condition to maintain someone at the top. Where you have gotten more subservience, you also have gotten less subversion of identities. Paradoxically, the deliberative process in Brazil has also been important for thinking about specific public policies. For example, the policies in the public health system for transgender people is an outcome of this kind of deliberation system. Even though, with an existing policy, a transgender can only benefit from it, if she or he or they has have been already classified as a pathological person who needs to be treated. It's that old biomedical concept that trans people were born in uh, the wrong body. Here we can understand that to have rights one needs to be subservient to this regime of sensibilities which considers that one has social rights, but not citizenship. Finally, the trick of resilience means the opposite of dissident. Many different images and discourse raised by the gender norms make us to feel that every gender no conforming is just an individual issue rather than a collective one. For example, this is the outcome of the psychopathologization phenomenon in Brazil that makes transgender people feel or believe that they have to engage in some kind of psychiatric treatment to be adjusted. To maintain a binary identity and to be resilient with their psychological condition, excluding them for the role of collective groups as social interaction, interactions. As a consequence, depression and suicidal behaviors have become very common in Brazil. Most of the them turn it into painful gender identities, unable to relate to the harmful gender norms, prejudices, and to every unequal condition that intentionally betrays their civil rights. This, this is how the majority of the public policies have brought, have brought some rights and access to specific programs in the public health system. This is how many families have found a way to take care of their transgender children. They have to run to the medical schools and try to find, and try to find out explanations for what feeds and what doesn't fit in the restrictive intelligibility of gender norms. So we have to decolonize our science to understand transgender people from their own experiences, from the knowledge that they have produced about themselves. The hegemonic science knows nothing about what is to have a life without any recognition, to have a decent action. We have to create a science of decent, a post-colonial science, 
I'm not arguing that we, for example, as a psychologist, are not important. However, not everything is about individual disease, about diagnosis and potential treatments. This type of medical syntax needs to give room to another logic, as it was given to the LGBT group. I think these tricks can be helpful to understand how action inside of gender norms fields can be a political action as political subjectivization. There are many paradoxes to explore it here. To be more direct, I invite us to think about how these elements play games into political action of those who are trying to question the gender norms field as a way of thinking, perceiving, and feeling about who is who. It's a game, and it's not fun. As we have seen, who decides who can be invited to a humanization? Who is able to share rights? Who can share lives that matter? And who are those that lives do not matter at all? What I have learned from the experience of Brazilian transgender political subjects is that they are playing inside the gender norms. They are between a bullet and a target. Or perhaps between what Hansier has defined as the police and the politics. The transgender political subjects have been organized through the gender norms discursive field. And it has made this field a political struggle. Sometimes asking for a new identity in such an essentialist form. Sometimes deconstructing those identities. In many other times showing their bodies to deliver some materiality to the harmful power of gender norms. Every now and then, building this tangled bridge from what's to be a man, a woman, either of them, both of them, and a few times any of them. Finally, I'd like to emphasize that we should be very, very careful when we try to academically analyze these political subjects. I hope you would agree that these paradoxical elements highlighted by me are indeed very complex. At the same time, the tricks presented here are also play very playful. They can move all the time, and also they can be more or less normative in different societies. Regardless, I take the risk of seeing that we should have a more dissident, subversive, and contingent political action especially if you want to challenge social hierarchies and democratize our democracies from people who have been left a part of it. Thank you very much. Can I 
And you kind of answered in, in your last part is that we have to be careful about how we make it into an academic discourse or how we talk about it as an academic theorize it. And, and again, I find myself agreeing, but could you tease out the specificity of care with respect to talking about transgender political subjectivity compared to, let's say, black subjectivity or some other? So again, sort of, you know, what are is there is there is the care that we have to take one at large about political political subjectivities, or what is the specificity recently transgender communities that that you are invoking? So okay, uh, thank you. With the strong questions. Uh, <laughs> I don't know if I can answer the end, but you know, let's think about it. Uh, so the first one, uh, the relation about identity in the space, I was just trying to uh, show how some, in, in, in some context, the space produce a lot of identities also to make some regulation about people. And that was very, Truth action in Brazil, especially with the LGBT movement in general, but with transgender movement in particular, uh, they were like the government was uh, asking people like to be identified as a real transgender. You have to say like you are a real transgender, and you know in Brazil we we have used uh, different words for transgender, which. Uh, makes a lot of sense because it's uh, an articulation with, with social class. Also, for example, tra um, the word travesty is, uh, we have used it as a political identity, but also that means some transgender uh, from low social class who has never gotten any Modification in their in their bodies. So transsexual is another word, like more magical word, right? And it's more some people is like I am the real transsexual because I got some seizures. You know what I mean? So the idea is like uh, the government was asking people like you have to be like a real transgender. You know, you have to go to the treatment. Through the public system, you have to get this kind of surgery, you have to get this kind of medicine to be a real one. It's a kind of like a, how you create some, uh, sometimes the state can be like a, ident a machine for identities, for new identities, right? Mm -hmm. Just to make the idea of nation, the idea of uh, we are here, we are people, we are a population, right? So that was the code, actually, uh, between like the strong identities and uh, the action of the state, the action of some governments, right? Uh, so in Hans Jair's views, this is uh, an important thing that uh, he's taking some uh, distance from this identity, from the identity, identity as a concept in the way to understand that the political subject is more experienced than probably somebody who is very aware about your situation, for example. It's not necessarily a social movement. Many social movements can be as a social movement, can say we are a social movement, but there is no politics in Hansiard's view there if they are just uh, asking for share some parts of the things uh, uh, of the, 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 the context, they have been there. So they are, they are asking for share some, I need more money here for this public system because we are there. So in Hansier feels the politics is uh, a different thing because he has pointed out that politics is more uh, how you can think uh, we, we should deconstruct in this kind of hierarchy all the time. Uh, 
uh, it's uh, there is no uh, fi final. There is no uh, new society we are going to face in the future. That is just like the politics is how we can deconstruct some social hierarchy all the time. So the identities are exactly in there. And that's the reason he's taking some distance from identities, like strong identities, and try to think about subjectivization as an experience. Um, so I was thinking about this talk, like uh, I have a lot of empirical information about this movement and about the transgender situation right now. I just finished one research, like a quantitative one, uh, a kind of social demography research with transgender people in my state. Uh, but it's a kind of boring thing, <coughs> just to show like uh, many different graphics, like uh, they are not going to the school, 60% doesn't have, you know, it's, it's like a, that's not like a good conversation for analytical thoughts. Uh, but uh, I have a lot of like a, uh, I have many different data that can show how this movement has been really in this paradoxical uh, movement all the time like to be a stronger identity and to take some distance in the same way uh, this, uh, in fact, this uh, debate about who can speak about transgender right now is really like a strong debate in Brazil because some transgender people are getting in the academic life right now. So they are asking for, we can speak about transgender because we live as a transgender. We know what is to be a transgender. We know what is to be oppressed. We know what is to be a real one. And you don't know, so you cannot speak for them. Uh, for me, it's a kind of like a really interesting debate and dispute because uh, first, that means can knowledge is such a power, right? So people would have this power to fight, to make a struggle, a political thing. So they, they, they need some knowledge. Like, uh, I don't believe in your science, because your science is the one who is making my, who is making my identity just like a not a health identity, not a recognized one. Uh, we have faced Main uh, dispute about who is the one who can speak about that. Uh, I have faced that all the time because I have worked with the transgender movement for many years, like 10, 12 years, and I have a good relationship with many leaders and, and women transgender and men transgender, even though we have this really like a complex relationship since I am from the academic. They are from the activism world, and now they are getting in the academic world, and they are producing papers and books. What is to be a transgender? So we have this dispute: like, uh, who who is more legitimated to speak about that? And somehow, actually, it's a good dispute because it makes the science to like you were shaking up. A little bit the loss of the science. But other sides is really like uh, I am more real than you. I can talk about that because I know what's to be a transgender. So I know what's to be a cisgender all the time. It's like a, that's not like a kind of choice we have made. It's more like a identification process, a complex identification process. So it's a real like a interesting subject, I think, because we are trying to produce a different uh, point of view about transgender in the way uh, to take some distance from the magical stuff a lot and go to human rights 
field, in both different fields, political field. It's very difficult in Brazil to find in political science or political uh, in political science more something about transgender. You cannot find this debate about what is political and transgender movement. It's not that social movement people would like to understand, actually. It's very uh, not legitimated as a political action. You know, this idea like, I, I need to show my body at the protest. I need to show what exactly gender wants are making through my body all the time. It's a kind of protest uh, any scientist, political scientist, or social scientist uh, is looking at exactly because it's not a kind of protest and you can understand that it's a political one. So, but what I'm trying to understand right now, and that's like a small piece of what I'm doing right now, is where we can see many political struggles in this experience, but we have not named it as a political action. But they are in dispute, they are, they are in, in such a struggle with us. They are trying to move laws, they are trying to move uh, gender norms, they are trying to expose gender norms, but we, are, we have not seen as a political action. It's just like, oh, okay, some praise transgender. They, you know, take some words in, about psychology or political science in speaking about. Like a, they, they, so they are not crazy, they are really exposed how the norms can hurt a life, can make a life, a life without life. That's the point. Um, yeah, you have a question? About the specificity of the trans, about the specificity? Oh, yeah. Uh, I really don't know. I don't know. Uh, I. I mean, I think. My point is uh, how I can, how I need to change my lens to understand political where uh, normally we cannot see political action. That's my point. So maybe we can look at a different movements and find that. But since transgender movement uh, has this really interesting way to understand gender norms and to talk about what is to be trans and to be cisgender and to be in a political action, I found it very interesting to, I found very interesting to try to understand how this kind of body, we have no intelligibility to understand many times, is exposing some political issues for us. That was my like uh, my, my my point of view to trying to understand this specific thing. How this body, which has been many times uh, not considered as a normal body, as a human being as a subject of rights, how this body is uh, delivering some information about what is political, what is the political, what is right, what is civil rights, what is gender norms, in some like, interesting ways, some creative ways. They are very creative in different uh, uh, programs, right? So I don't know if I... I used those yeah, pictures. That, yeah, actually, I showed one picture: the transgender man movement. Yes. It's very interesting to look at that picture, and you can think many different things about gender norms in the same picture, right? Yeah, and I agree. And and I just like, like a. To just just one sentence, but like, just again, I agree. But as I'm listening to you and I'm thinking about what I'm going to teach tomorrow, looking at John Scott's piece on experience and equality versus difference. It, seems to me as if there are parallels with a lot of categories that get politicized at different moments. My own look is on black movements, and it's still not clear who's black. Oh, yeah. 
So there are parallels and differences, and it's worthwhile teasing them out. I think that would be the difference though between sort of queer and trans in a way, right? Mm -hmm. Queer wanting to abolish the idea of who's and he's you know, not abolished, but you know, fluid to, in terms of who's who and people who are affirming a trans identity are doing so very yeah, yeah. rigorously demarcating here I am black it would be the equivalent of I am black, whether you see me as black or not is irrelevant. I am a man, I am a woman. Okay. Um, and then I have a question. Okay. Thank you for your conference. My my concern is connected to one of the points that you mentioned at the beginning of the talk. When you said that one of the main critiques about the classical social movement has to do with the disconnection between the political subjectivities of the subjects who are involved. Um, in the, in the classical length or theories about social movements. In the case of transgender people, black people, indigenous people, their subjectivities and I, I am an identity. And I would like to know, for example, as you mentioned the question, who can I speak and who has the permission to talk or to speak about the others? My question is, in relation to how can you connect, for example, those particular questions with your proposal about the necessities to construct a post-colonial science or a science of dissonance. Mm -hmm. In a specific way, how can the problem of translations, because when we ask about who can speak or who has the permission, how can the problem of translations and the creation of a new theory or science of dissonance can be negotiated. Because you said that uh, as an ad, uh, academics as well as an activist, we need to pay careful attention to the ways in which we, put in the ways in which we reconstruct the ideas of the others, in this case, the, 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 the gender movement. And I would like to, to know how can we negotiate the, the, the relationship between translations and the possibility of science of this. Let me ask you a question. Yeah. <laughs> um, I know it really is an empirical question. 